straight ahead on 12 News, a new year, a new building. We'll take you to the school that has not only grown, but is also helping to preserve a culture. Plus, a Cooper student aims for a school first with the wind at her back. Hopefully, you know, we're able to build it at Cooper and, and she can kind of be that driving force. But for social media and its impact on political campaigns. It really does make sense to think small here. 12 News starts right now. and thanks for joining us. Political candidates may not agree on a lot of things, but they're on the same page when it comes to social media. Now, local candidates say campaigning used to be entirely in person. Well, now you have to do both, and that's especially true in a tight race like the one for state senate in Plymouth. That's how Deb Calvert is working to create opportunities for us all. I'm Paul Anderson, and I'm running for the Minnesota State Senate. To These are political ads that may never be seen on television. They are internet ads by Deb Calvert and Paul Anderson, who are running against each other in a hotly contested race for a state Senate seat. Both candidates know the importance of social media to reach out to a targeted group. One of the most important demographics that's shiftable is the younger demographic. So uh, campaigns rise and fall often on uh, how young people access their information. Everybody is consumed with their tablet or their, their smartphone or their computer. And so to, to meet them where they're at and where they're spending the time is, is, is critical. Political professor David Schultz says it's a way local candidates can target an audience like never before. Oftentimes we want to think big, but think small now. Social media, web pages, think in terms of all, you know, of Twitter, all the ways that you can sort of micro uh, manage your message to a smaller population and it reduces your costs and targets it more efficiently. Deb Calvert says social media is more flexible than other forms of political advertising. You can target your audiences um, based on their interests, the kinds of things they look up online, their age groups, where they live. Calvert and Paul Anderson have worked on other political campaigns in the past and both are still doing plenty of door knocking but they say social media in politics has gotten to the point where it's hard now to imagine a campaign without it you might have been able to get away with just um, direct voter contact uh, you know phone calls and so forth and now um, I think it has to be a full court press. It's an independent-minded voting district, and so they are going to do the, the, the background, and you better be uh, uh, competing on their level for information. And beginning on Tuesday, we will begin our series of local candidate profiles. You will hear from a wide range of candidates, including people running for Congress, city council, and school boards. And you can see the profiles on our newscast right here and on our website, 12.tv. A new era is underway for Robbinsdale Area Schools as they celebrate a new learning facility in Crystal. <laughs> the Robbinsdale School Superintendent and other community leaders cut the ribbon on the new Crystal Learning Center located in the Crystal Shopping Center. The facility will serve close to 350 adult students working to get their GEDs, gaining job skills, and those learning English as a second language. Previously, these adult learning programs were housed at Sandburg Learning Center in Golden Valley, but this facility offers a better location. It's easier access for our student populations um, with public transportation. The majority of our students are in this area of Robbinsdale Area Schools, so this location is prime for our students. The new space in the Crystal Shopping Center also gives young adults going through the programs easier access to nearby jobs. Well, Tuesday is the first day of school for many students. It's also opening day for a brand new school in Brooklyn Center. We get more from Eric Nelson. It's a new beginning for the new Millennium Academy. We have better classroom size, air conditioning, so students are very excited, as well as the parents and myself. On Tuesday, the Brooklyn Center Charter School will be christened. It is very exciting. As 660 students will walk these hallways and sit in these classrooms for the first time. To actually open a brand new facility is an amazing challenge, and it's also just an amazing a uh, treat. Construction crews were all over campus Friday finishing up various projects. Even the squeegee squad was busy making sure the windows are spotless. This new facility 
is a huge upgrade. And we always have been looking for a home. For the past 11 years, New Millennium was located in two smaller buildings in North Minneapolis. It will be great. Um, some of our classrooms in the other building were in the basement. Some of them were very tiny. New Millennium is a K through eight school with a focus on preserving Hmong culture. The mission and the vision is to work in a community where we're looking for high achievement, high academic achievement, as well as preserve and promote the Hmong literature and culture. New Millennium also has a shiny new playground, plenty of green space, and a cool school nickname. We're the rhinos. The rhino is a very sacred animal, and they are not everywhere. The price tag of the New Millennium Academy is $10 million. Many of the students will come from the Northwest Quadrant of Brooklyn Center, Brooklyn Park, Osseo, and Robbinsdale. In Brooklyn Center, I'm Eric Nelson, Channel 12 News. And as students head back to school, one student will be trying to tackle a new challenge. And she is trying to start the first ever sailing club at Cooper High School. Reporter Shannon Slatton shows us why. Summers in Minnesota are meant to be spent on a lake. And on a lake is where you would find 16-year-old Anastasia Sikola. I really enjoy just going out in the water and just kind of like talking with the person I sail with. And then you really create a good relationship with that with them. Anastasia has loved sailing since learning how at a sailing camp. I learned to sail in San Francisco when I was nine because my uncle wanted all of us to learn because he lives out there. Now she wants to represent her school at regattas doing what she loves. I think it'd be fun to have a team at school because it's just like a really good bonding activity and like you can just use your outside skills from like school and bring it on the water. So Anastasia gave up soccer and dance this year in hopes of forming a sailing club at Cooper High School. For her own school, being the only person, it's kind of like you kind of have to get the momentum going and, and show that the sport isn't just, you know, this, this big yacht, you know, sailing an ocean kind of sport that we have it here in the Twin Cities. There are several one-person teams representing high schools that sail out of the Lake Calhoun Sailing School. For a fee, students use the boats, practice, and compete at regattas on lakes throughout the state. Hopefully, you know, we're able to build it at Cooper and, and she can kind of be that driving force. Anastasia knows it won't be a breeze. There's fundraising and hours of practice ahead. It's worth the challenge. It's a lifelong skill you can have. But this Cooper Hawk knows her classmates would also enjoy the reward that comes from catching the wind on the lake. I'm glad that uh, people like Anastasia are, are starting you know, teams within their schools and exposing it to people that don't otherwise see it. At Lake Calhoun, Shannon Slatton, 12 News. The school is working out the details on the sailing club, but the first step is getting people to sign up. Coming up, local artists provide a more colorful view at the State Fair. And then later in sports, it's our final prep training camp report as we visit the Breck Mustangs. But first, a decent Labor Day weekend, though Labor Day itself looks a little unsettled with a chance for showers. We'll be right back. The Fine Arts Building at the State Fair houses one of the best cross-sections of art that you're likely to find. And Neil personally found artists from the Northwest Metro to be well represented. He shows us a few examples in today's Weekend Showcase. The building at the Minnesota State Fair provides lots of space to show off the very best examples of fine art in our state. Still, the space is finite and not everyone who submits a work gets chosen to exhibit. It's extraordinary. There's just so many talented artists. Maple Grove artist Christine Fretheim is a very accomplished watercolor artist who submitted a piece called Euphoria. My inspiration is moving in an abstract direction, but also uh, sticking with organic shapes in nature. Euphoria is Christine's most recent work from her vibrant Branching Out series. Most people think of watercolor as being um, very faint and soft and and loose and watery, but so I, I don't fit that stereotype of watercolor. Every year, the exhibit in the Fine Arts Building is the most well-attended art show in the state of Minnesota. Think about it. If you have an average 1.8 million people that attend the state fair each year, and just 1% of those come into the Fine Arts Building, well, that's 18,000 people that are probably going to see your work. I feel really, really honored. Crystal Denison, Jennifer Thurston, is another one of only 300 artists selected to have a piece exhibited. Jennifer's entry is entitled Weathered. The photo 
that I submitted was a picture that I took at Franconia Sculpture Park. I did some fun things to it just to make it kind of stand out and look the way I wanted it to look. Having a long history working in photography, producing fine art photography is something relatively new for Jennifer. Playing with it a lot digitally and then playing with it digitally again and then playing with it digitally again and I finally ended up with the final product that I wanted. The quality of the artwork is outstanding and if you go you're sure to find something that appeals to you. For Weekend Showcase, I'm Neil Bursley, 12 News. Cool stuff. Well, coming up, a great Minnesota get-together without the traffic hassle. We found it in Robbinsdale. We'll explain a little bit later. But first, the prep football season kicks off with a big matchup between Maple Grove and Osseo. John Jacobson has that and more up next in sports. Always good to start the season off with a good, strong rivalry, and we saw that with Osseo Maple Grove last night. A lot of people in the house for this one, anticipating the season opener and a, a good comeback for Maple Grove. And the Osseo football team is coming off a state title run last fall. Maple Grove has made back-to-back -back trips to the Class 6A semifinals, and they met up in the debut for Ryan Stockhouse's Osseo head coach. After a bad punt snap by Maple Grove, Osseo's Marmar Hughes well hits Alfonso Balia in the flat. He scores for a quick 7-0 Osseo lead. Early in the second quarter, Hughes rolls right, and he hits Ron Gray, who spins away from a tackler and scores. The Orioles capitalize on turnovers to lead 13-0. Maple Grove turns it around though. Quarterback Brad Davison on the sweep left scores easily to make it 13-7. A field goal brings the Crimson within 13-10 at the half. The second half is mostly Maple Grove. Davison throws to Jack Dugan for the touchdown. The Crimson take the lead for the first time at 17-13. Their defense holds Osseo in check and Davison helps to clinch it. He takes the long and winding road for a 46-yard touchdown run. Maple Grove wins 23-13, their first on-field win over Osseo since 2009. I think we just calmed down and we had a different mindset. Um, we just played more confident and we really believed in ourselves. That was the biggest thing. We came out to start and we were slow and we just weren't really into the game, I don't think. Um, I, again, I take responsibility for that, but we really picked it up. I'm really proud of my teammates, what we did tonight. Whites well, had to open the season on the road Thursday night with a West Metro District game at Blaine. Beautiful night for football at Blaine High School. Early second quarter, Blaine running back Chase Harper runs for his second of three touchdowns in the game. Bengals take a 14 to nothing lead on the Trojans. Whites well, had to trail by two scores in the third quarter when they start their comeback. Keyshawn Aksuk with a nine yard run for a TD and it's 21 14. Then in the fourth quarter, Alexuk again, nice run here. He'll get to the pylon in the front corner of the end zone for another touchdown. The game's tied at 21. But Blaine would retake the lead, and Wyzetta, after having a touchdown called back late in the game, sees this pass picked off by Blaine Sam Garrity. It'll turn out to be a pick six for the final points of the night. Blaine beats Wyzetta 33 to 21. The Trojans are at Shakopee next Friday. He does get to the end zone. Champlin Park at Minnetonka. The Rebels down 14-7 at halftime. Late in the third quarter, Ernest Warlow getting through the hole. 53 yards for a touchdown for Champlin Park. And it's 14-all. Early fourth quarter, Tonka quarterback Garrett Olson with a two-yard touchdown run. The Skippers take the lead back. Olson scores again on another short touchdown run that seals it. Champlin Park loses 28-14. Totino Grace scored a big win Thursday. They beat Eden Prairie 17-14. This Labor Day weekend, we have a 12 sports special presentation for you. you can watch our Hall of Fame specials. We welcome the class of 2016. Four great athletes from the area will be honored. Watch the 12 sports Hall of Fame special Saturday night at 9 and 9.30 p.m. But several times Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. See at those times and our website, 12.tv, as well. Numbers are down a little bit at Breck football, but the Mustangs believe they still have some good talent. Here's our final prep football training camp report. It's a less than seasoned team that Breck will put on the field Friday nights this fall. Just over 30 players are out for football with a lot of underclassmen. And we lost uh, a lot of starters off of last year's team and, and uh, you know, it's, it's the, the learning curve seems to be a little, 
a little slow. Um, but, you know, it's it's good days and bad days. The Mustangs do feature a special talent. In six foot four inch, 250 pound sophomore David Roddy. He'll play both quarterback and defensive end. He's not human. He's his body type and everything. He's super athletic. I mean, basketball, football, everything. He's got all the skills. So, I mean, he's a great asset to the team. Other players to watch for include Soren Salveson, a good sized offensive and defensive lineman who's beginning his third year as a starter. Daniel Coons will go both ways at wide receiver and linebacker, while Ethan Gio plays receiver and safety. And Isaac Luton is a captain playing both center and linebacker. Around those guys, though, are a lot of untested varsity players. Still, the Mustangs believe they can surprise some people. I think we could really do well in the passing game and the running game. I guess just our energy level is uh, something we really take pride in. We're really trying to get a dog mentality out here, just making sure that no one can beat us. We, right now, it's us beating ourselves, so we got to go out there. It doesn't matter the size, it doesn't matter the numbers. We got to go out there and just play our hearts out. John Martin starts his third year as Breck's head coach. They open the season at home tonight, Friday, against Providence Academy. We'll have that game for you live on Channel 12 and HD Channel 799 or online at 12.tv. And that's a look at sports. All right, thanks, John. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back. Now, finally, for some, going to the State Fair is a Labor Day tradition. But for a Robbinsdale family, their tradition is hosting the other great Minnesota get-together. Our party this year is Follow the Monarch. So basically, um, you can bring food that's any place where the monarch flies south. Paul and Winnie Heil send out elaborate themed invitations each year for their Labor Day backyard party. It is a 51-year-old tradition started when the Heils were newlyweds in the 1960s. The couple is now in their 70s and they've had everything from a spam theme party to a Hawaiian one with as many as 160 guests. The party helps them stay in touch with family and friends. And then when they're here, then we make a plan to get together again with just four of us or six of us. And that keeps us current with our friends. Otherwise, I think they just kind of fall by the wayside. Yeah. And our, and our friendships are really critical to our relationship. You know, so. We made friendships going back to grade school, actually, some of the, some of the people that arrive here, yeah. This year, the Hiles are expecting around 100 guests. And that does it for us. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a great Labor Day weekend, everyone. See you next week.